AI has become the hot topic of the year. They can talk, they can generate things out of thin air like this. Not bad. And you can't tell the difference. I mean, can you? Well, sorry about that. That's my AI twin. Well, to fully understand this topic, I did some research. First on how artificial intelligence is built upon the biological knowledge of our brain. The individual brain cells responsible for analyzing data and making decisions are called neurons. They have a quite different shape than the traditional spherical shape you probably remember from high school biology. Notably, it has these long arms and a long tail. The long arms is a way for individual neurons to receive signal from other neurons via electrical signal. Then the neuron will process the information inside and transmit the processed information to other neurons downstream. These neurons are all connected to each other by having the arm of one neuron touching the tail of another neuron. Let's use a simple example with nine neurons. For the ones that are nearby, they will connect right away. For the ones that are further apart, the neurons would find its way to connect to the distant neurons. There is one important property about them. There is an information delay among the neurons, meaning some neurons will receive the signal first, process the information, and then pass it along to the next set of neurons. So let's label this first set of neurons as one, because they are the first to receive information. You can think of them as neurons that live inside your eyes, that can convert images into electrical signals, process the information, and pass it to the next set of neurons, which will label as two, process the information again, and pass it along to the final set of neurons, which will label as three. You can think of this as where our brain makes the final decision. These connections and neurons are too complex to understand. We like simple things. Let's first entangle the wires by temporarily remove them from the drawing. We'll put them back shortly, then replace each neuron with a circle, rearrange the neurons based on the order at which they receive the information. Finally, we bring back the connections back again. This is what we call a neural network, and these neurons labeled with the same number are referred to as layers. In fact, our brain contains 86 billion neurons, so the network is much, much more complex than this. So based on this, researchers thought, can we actually build an artificial neural network that works just like the human brain? How would that work? Well, let's say we want to build a simple artificial neural network that can distinguish between two objects, a car and an airplane. The first layer usually is the layer that takes in the information, so they are often referred to as the input layer. For simplicity, we design the system to have the same number of neurons as the number of pixels in our picture. Each neuron takes information in from each pixel and converts them into numerical values based on their color and intensity. This information is then passed along to the second layer, processed further, and passed along to the final layer, which we often refer to as the output layer. One for cars, the other one for airplanes. So the question is, what is the middle layer? In real cases, we don't really know how AI thinks. It's like a black box, but I find it intuitive to think of the middle layer as the features layer. For example, wheels, wings, jet engine, and rear mirrors. Features of the images. When the artificial neural network sees the image of a car, features like wheels and rear mirrors will receive a high value, and the car is identified. This is how artificial neural network works at a high level. Hmm. Actually, back in 1958, an American psychologist named Frank Rosenblatt actually built such a machine. It was called the Perceptron. A simple one input layer and one output layer. To recognize the difference between males and females. It is something that all of us can do easily. But it did not work very well. Fast forward to the 2000s. A group of researchers started a new competition, ImageNet, challenging AI researchers around the world to perform image recognition on 1,000 different object classes. The winner is announced each year based on the smallest error rate. In 2010, Researchers were able to achieve a 72% accuracy, or 28% error rate. 2011 winner improved the error rate to 25.8%. Surprisingly, the 2012 winner achieved an astonishing 16.4% error rate. It was called AlexNet. It was designed by a University of Toronto group, graduate student Alex, graduate student Ilya, who is now the chief scientist behind OpenAI and ChatGPT, and Professor Hinton, who is referred to as the godfather of AI today. Their famous paper explained their work in detail. In their work, they use more complex neural network, one called convolutional neural network. AlexNet contains five convolutional layers and three fully connected layers, and a total of 650,000 neurons. So the model was able to learn in more depth. But another important thing to note is that they also applied GPU to their model training. More neurons and layers make sense, but why GPU? Why is this better than the traditional CPU that we use? Hmm. The key lies in the architecture difference between the GPU 
and the CPU. Imagine CPU as a strong person. If, for example, we think of the computer as a construction site, then CPU can be thought of as the workers doing all the heavy lifting. However, if the work required consists of many small tasks, of course CPU can still do it. But they will need to do it one by one, which requires a lot of time to complete the task. Instead, GPUs are designed to solve this problem. Although they are less powerful individually, but each one of them is capable of carrying out this small task. So together, they can complete it in much shorter time. This person is what we refer to as cores. In CPU, a strong person is like a large core that can support operating system, copy and paste new files, and process words when we type. Whereas in GPU, it consists of many smaller cores that can perform many smaller tasks together. Our screen consists of a few million pixels. For example, if we were to render this image, using a single core CPU, it will process one pixel at a time. Compared to GPU, you will be able to render more pixels at a time and get the job done faster. Nvidia's latest flagship GPU, 4090, has over 16,000 cores. This is why GPU is much more powerful when it comes to video graphics and gaming than CPU. GPU is also quite popular in simulation and scientific computations. The parallel computing capability is also the reason why GPU is a perfect solution for AI. Because in AI training, we go from one layer to the next. All it is doing is matrix multiplication, multiplying a whole bunch of numbers and adding them together. In the case of CPU, it's like a very powerful calculator. We will perform calculation one neuron at a time, which is time consuming. However, if you can take advantage of the many smaller calculators in GPU, we will perform all of these calculations simultaneously. But GPU is not specifically designed for AI training, although they have tiny cores compared to CPU, but it's still a more versatile, more general purpose platform. Whereas in AI training, all we need is some sort of matrix operation. So GPU's high precision and versatility actually slow down the AI training performance while taking up a lot of energy. What we should do is to do it in parallel and in parallel. And so this is what the Volta Tensor Core does. It literally does the 4x4 four four multiply plus C at the same time. To solve this problem, NVIDIA introduced Tensor GPU, specializing matrix operation. NVIDIA then introduced Ampere architecture in 2020 and Hopper architecture in 2022. Of course, NVIDIA is not without competition. Here is their longtime rival AMD. I am super excited to show you, for the very first time, MI300X. Intel also has been making moves in this space. Introducing Gaudi 2, executed in 7 nanometer and built on the high-efficiency Gaudi architecture. Gaudi 2 ups the equation with nearly double NVIDIA's A100 processor throughput for ResNet 50 and BERT training models while retaining remarkable efficiency. There's also Google's Tensor Processing Unit, TPU. Let me introduce you to the new Google Tensor G3. In our new Tensor G3 chip, every major subsystem has been upgraded. And of course, the TPU, our on-device AI engine that we've custom designed to run Google's AI models efficiently. Microsoft also recently introduced their new chip, Maya, for AI training. Our first fully custom in-house AI accelerator, Azure Maya. <laughs> Starting with Maya 100, designed to running cloud AI workloads like LLM training and inference. But besides NVIDIA's hardware advantage, I think one important point that's usually overseen by many people, and I think that's what set NVIDIA apart from the competition, is their software platform play. They give you their software entirely for free, hold annual developer conferences and workshops. 9,000 of the world's best developers, researchers, and business leaders swarmed Silicon Valley this week, aimed at harnessing the power of AI across industries to speed data science, ray trace realism in real time, bring AI to the edge, make self-driving cars a reality, and much more. NVIDIA have made some smart moves and investments over the years, making great progress in both the hardware space and the software space, enable them to be the winner of this AI wave. If you want to dive deeper in this topic, I highly recommend 3Blue1Brown's 4 episodes on this topic. I will leave a link in the description below.